Cornerstone. It's so good to see everybody here. We want to welcome all our online guests. I know that we have several people traveling, well, more than several. We have lots and lots of people traveling this week. I trust that our online attendance is going to be up uh, today. And uh, for those of you in-house, welcome. God is about to move. How many of you know that? Amen. Uh, I want to bring forth our offering. The first thing we do on Sunday mornings is we take our offering. If you um, are new to Cornerstone, we have several ways that you can give here at Cornerstone. We do not generally pass the offering plate here. We have two stations outside uh, in the lobby where you can give an offering. You can also put offering in the lock boxes at the back if you have uh, material offerings to give. If you want to give online, you can do that as well by going to our website and going to the giving portal there. Uh, we want to uh, just bring up our giving scripture this morning because every month we do a giving scripture and uh, we share those scriptures together and because we believe that the word is powerful. Can somebody say amen? So our scripture today is from 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 7. Since you excel in so many ways, in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in the gracious act of giving. I'm going to read that again, just so that we get it into our hearts. Since you excel, Cornerstone Church, in so many ways, in your faith, in your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. Giving is a powerful anointing of the Holy Spirit. Someone say amen. Let's pray together. Extend a hand of faith towards the offering basket today. And let's believe together for God to bring a mighty harvest so that we can build his kingdom. Father God, we begin this day by offering up the gift of giving to you because you have given so much to us. You have given us our, your everything, Lord Jesus. And so, Lord, we give back to you what we have of our material blessings and more beside. Lord, this day as we pray over this offering, we pray a blessing on the giver and the gift. But we also pray that as a church, we would excel in the gift of giving our lives to Jesus Christ in full measure, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing, knowing that everything we give to you will come back to us. We pray these things together as a congregation, and everybody says in the name of Jesus, amen, amen, and amen. Before we enter into worship, we have a couple of quick announcements that I want to bring. And uh, those are, first of all, we have our chili cook-off on October 29th. Listen, some of, some of the DLT groups have, uh, well, one of the DLT groups has already brought me uh, their, what they think is their contender, I have to admit it was pretty good. So folks, bring your A game to that day. A suggested donation is of $3 is more than welcome. And if you have more, we want to encourage you to bring that as well. All proceeds go to our parking lot project. How many of you are liking driving on flat ground? Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make every mountain level and every valley plain. We have done that in our parking lot. Amen. Uh, those of you who are decorating your doorways, and I'm assuming that every DLT group who is participating has not only a chili cooker, but a doorway decorator. And so for doorway decorators, you can decorate on the Saturday, the 28th, from 3 to 5 p.m. All right. Water baptism, October 29th. The class, for those of you who have signed up for water baptism, and I know there are about five or six of us, six of you who are going to be baptized uh, this time. And so the class is on Wednesday night before. It's on October 25th. It will be at 6 o'clock. And uh, you will meet me in the uh, lobby right out here, and we'll go up together. Uh, just a quick note, also, this month is Pastor Appreciation Month. And finally, at, at the end of this service, kids will be dismissed. I'm going to have you, at the, when I 
when I come up to preach, I will give you instructions. You're going to follow Pastor Amanda for room assignments today because we had some challenges early this morning uh, with uh, teachers being able to, to attend. So we've had to reorganize things a little bit, but we've got it covered. Everyone say amen. amen. All right. Our scripture today is, uh, as we begin to enter into worship, is from Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same verse, voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the spirit and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones like Jasper and Carnelian and the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. 24 thrones surrounded him and 24 elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had golden crowns on their heads. Verse five, from the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder and in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. What a powerful image of scripture. Let's pray. Why don't you stand with me? And let's just give glory to the God who is going to bring this vision to pass in all of our lives. Father God, we come before you today. And we declare that in our eyes, we are beginning to see the door standing open in heaven. We are preparing our hearts as a church, as a people, and as individuals to be ready to go through that door when the trumpet sounds. We are all awaiting the sound of the call of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who will make our calling and election sure. We know, Lord Jesus, that according to your promise, you who have begun a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. And Lord, it will be completed on that day and how our hearts long for that completion. Jesus, we pray that your spirit would attend us this day. We pray that as we worship, as we lift our voice in praise, that you would open our eyes to see your Father seated on the throne of heaven, encircled with a rainbow, shining like the sun. And we pray, Lord God, that we as a people would be captured with such awe and such a spirit of adventure that all lukewarmness would be shattered and washed away and that the power of Jesus would course through our lives into this region, changing us and the people of our region for time and for eternity. Lord God, this is our heart's cry as a church, and we pray that you would hear it and answer us with your power. In Jesus' mighty name and all God's children said, amen and amen. Make it personal. Make it your heart cry. God, we thank you. We welcome you in these doors this morning. You are here, and we stand on that. We believe that you are already here. We believe that we don't even have to ask because you already are. Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus, and I thank you that the power that name holds all power and all authority lie in that name. That name is the name that which we can stand. That name is the name that which we are able to live in, to breathe. Father, we say we are nothing without the name of Jesus, and we thank you for the name of Jesus, because the name of Jesus has power. The name of Jesus in the name is healing. In the name is restoration. In the name is wholeness. In the name is completeness. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. 
all begin to raise your voices to the Lord this morning. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Son. The name of Jesus, the only name I can stand upon, the name that's trustworthy, the name that doesn't fail. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We stand upon your name. We stand upon your name. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your, Your name, name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression. I speak Jesus, we speak your name, speak his name, I just want to speak the name of Jesus, over fear and all anxiety, to every soul that can't divide Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the street. 
Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus on my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus, your name is power, your name is healing, your name over you. I don't want anything but you. You're more than every dream come true. All of the things I thought I wanted don't.
You guys, this time sing it again. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Oh, you can have all this world. Just give me Jesus, that's all I need. That's all I want. I don't need anything else. I don't need anything else. In you is all I need. The greatest father, the greatest provider and friend. Before me, you will never leave 
driven by anxiety, you who come here burdened down with the needs of your family, the needs of your friends, your own personal needs. The Lord saw you awake in the night praying. The Lord has seen you awake in the night crying out to him. He's heard your voice. answer you want may not have come. The answer you were expecting, the way you wanted it to work, may not be working out, and yet you need to know that your God hears you. And He walks with you. He walks with you in the place of shadow. He walks with you in the place of disappointment. I speak today to souls who are disappointed because it hasn't worked out the way you wanted to, you wanted it to. You've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed and you've come with your expectations and you've poured your faith on the altar and it has not transpired. It has not worked out according to your plan. 
But what you need to know is you were never play, praying forth your plan anyway. You were always praying forth God's plan and God's ways and God's plans are better. They're higher. They factor in things you don't understand. That's cold comfort to someone who wanted things to work out a certain way. Your heart is broken. Your heart is filled with disappointment. And the Lord says to you, let me wrap you in my arms. I will comfort you. I will weep with you. I will hold you. I love you, says your God. I love you. I know the plans that I have for you. I know the plans that I have for this situation, and they are plans to prosper and to bless, but the way is different than what you thought. Don't be alarmed. Don't be concerned. I am working. I am working. Even when you can't see it, I'm working. Even when you can't feel it, I'm working. Will you embrace the Waymaker and will you let the Waymaker embrace you? Your God says, my ways are better. My ways may lead through a difficult pass right now, but my ways are better. will walk with the Lord. If you will walk with the Lord, just lift your hand and pray to say, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Across this room, just begin to give him your praise and say, yes, even though the way is difficult, I will go. Even though the way is unexpected, I will go. Even though, uh, even though I'm disappointed, I will go. Even though I don't understand it, I will go. Even though I don't see it, I will go. Even though I don't feel it, I will go. God, I worship you. You are God and I am not. And I give your way, your way, your way. Because your ways are higher than my ways. Your ways are wiser than my ways. Jesus, Jesus, I come into your way. I come into your presence right now, right now, right now. Let God wrap you in his arms of love. Let God wrap you in his arms of love. He's got arms of love and he will hold you. He will hold you through the storm that he prophesied in advance you were going to walk through. Jesus has you. Jesus has your family. Jesus has your circumstance. Do you believe it? I have faith. I have faith to believe it, Jesus. You're working. You're working. You're working. I know you're working. I may not know what you're doing but you're working. I may not know what you're doing in my infirmity, but I know this, you're working. I know, I may not know how you're working in my family, but I know you're working because I've prayed you in, God. I've prayed you in, and I haven't stopped praying, and I won't stop praying. Tell your God, tell your God, commit to your God. Jesus, it's your way, it's your way, it's your way. We want your we want your way. We want your way. Just give us Jesus. Just you, Lord. Whatever that looks like. Whatever that looks like. Whatever that looks like. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Speak Jesus over your life. Say, Jesus is the answer. Jesus, you're the answer. Jesus, you are my only answer. Jesus, Jesus, you're the God that I serve. You're my
comfortable. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. Keep singing that over and over again. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. Wrap me in your arms. Keep singing it. There is safety. afraid of in his wings. There is safety under his shadow. I invite you, any fears, any questions, any doubts you have, he is safe. He is secure. He has answers. You can bring your doubts safely. He wants to hear them. He loves to hear them. Don't let them stay doubts and questions and fears. If you keep them to yourself, you will never get the answers you seek so dearly. The answers are found in him. He has created a safe space here today. There is a safe and there is a healthy space here available to you to be able to have that first conversation, to have that conversation of the questions and of the doubts and of the fears. He has opened it up to you today. It's available right here and right now. And I want to tell you, as someone who walked it himself and is still walking it himself, I want to tell you firsthand, this is a healthy place. He is a safe place to bring your questions and your needs. I have to learn that daily, and I'm still learning that daily. I know firsthand. And so I want to invite you. I want to invite you personally. Have that conversation while the space is open and healthy and available to you. It's been put in front of you. Will you take this step towards healing, wholeness, and answers? Will you take this step towards Jesus? Lord Jesus, this morning, we have declared that you are the answer. And I just pray for brothers and sisters in this room who may be struggling with that answer. Lord, I know that this life, this existence that we walk in right now is geared to distract us from you. And to make us think that there are lots of other answers besides you. When we sing songs like, give me Jesus, there's a part of us that wants to truly embrace that. And there's another part of us that just kind of laughs at the idea and thinks that, think that that's a pipe dream. That there are so many other things that we need. You couldn't possibly be our everything. You couldn't possibly be our one thing. Lord, it's time for that mindset to change. It's time for that stronghold to be torn down. And it's time for our thoughts and our, our, our words and our actions to be challenged in those areas where we are not letting you be our one thing. 
Jesus, this morning I pray that you would help us, invade us, Lord God. Invade every area of our life. We give you permission. We give you permission to enter in. Now you give Jesus permission. Say, Jesus, I give you permission. I give you permission, Jesus. He's listening in and he's saying, yes, it's time. It's time for me to invade. It's time for me to be filled. It's time for me to come in through the cracks and the crevices and take over. Will you let Jesus take over? If you will let Jesus take over, just say, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. We give it to you. We give you our everything. We give you our all. In Jesus' name, amen. to be in the presence of the Lord. Boy, the power of God is weighty in this place. How many of you sense his presence here today? At this moment, I'm just going to dismiss our children for Children's Church. Pastor Amanda is waiting right out the door. Remember, kids, she has some room assignments for you to do, so follow her team and you will get to the room that you need to be in. Um, parents, uh, be mindful of the fact that you're, uh, because of our teacher situation, we've had to renegotiate things a little bit. So uh, you might be used to going to a certain room and you might get there and your child is not there. That doesn't mean we've moved them. They're just in another room in the, just ask Pastor Amanda or the staff down there and you will find your child. Hallelujah. Lord, I just pray for your word today as we dig into your word. I pray that you would help us. Lord, I, I, I feel like a time has come when you're going to be just be speaking over us prophetically by the power of the Holy Spirit. You've been doing that right along, but I feel like it's about to intensify. And I pray, Lord God, that you would open our hearts and our ears and our minds to receive uh, what you are doing. In the mighty name of Jesus and all God's children said, amen. amen. All right, so you can turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 4. Uh, we are going to be digging into passages all throughout the scripture. We're going to be in uh, Isaiah. We're going to be in Exodus 28, Exodus 35, Deuteronomy 4. We're going to be in Psalm 127 for a bit. And uh, I just want, uh, we're going to be looking at a whole bunch of scripture today as we dig deeper into this idea of who God is. Our study uh, is entitled, and I know that most of you know this, and it's going to be review for you, but I want to make sure that we do this review. It's very important for us to do review as a congregation because we have, we are combating, whether you recognize it or not, we're, rec we're combating a spirit in America, a spirit in our land which is a judgment, a judgment of uh, a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. And that doesn't mean that there's an absence of, of the word of the Lord. There is lots of word of God in America to be had. But there is a power working in the spirit realm that would dull our senses to the adventure and the glory of the word of God uh, being applied particularly and individually to our lives. So we hear the word of God, and maybe some of you have experienced this, or maybe you know someone who's experienced it. You hear the word of God, and you walk away, and, it's, and you immediately forget the word of God. And it's like a man, Paul the Apostle says, it's like a man looking in the mirror, and as soon as he steps away from the mirror, he forgets what he looks like. Now, I've had this experience, and so I'm sure you have had this experience as well, that you will hear a word from the Lord, and you'll say, oh, that is a great word. That is a word for my life. And that will happen on a Sunday or maybe in a worship room on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It could happen anywhere. You might be listening to the radio, to a television radio evangelist, or maybe you're watching it on television, and you'll say, that's a word for my life. And you walk away, and suddenly 
it's the next day and you're trying to remember that word and it's been stolen. How many of you have had that experience? Right? I know there was a word of God for me. I just can't remember what the word is. And you have to sit and you actually have to pray and say, Lord, what, what is it that's been taken from me? Have you ever done that? And then the Lord brings it back and you're like, how could I have forgotten? So we're, we're rehearsing the word of the Lord over and over and over again because we've got to get it down into our souls so that the enemy cannot steal the seed from our hearts. Somebody say amen. amen. So we are studying and our study is called Jesus Doing Life Part 2 and we are currently in Jesus Doing Life Part 2, Part 14. And we're going to be going on this with this. My titles are not going to be super interesting for the next probably till Jesus comes, and that's okay. I have a sense. I just, I keep saying to the staff, I was like, we may be stuck here until the Lord returns. I don't know why. But we are doing a study through the book of Revelation. And what we have learned is that the book of Revelation is not a revelation about what's going to happen in the future, although it is that. It's not a revelation about what's going to happen in the church, although it is that. It's not a revelation about what's going to happen in Israel, although it is that. The book of Revelation is primary a revelation, primarily a revelation of who Jesus is as he comes back. And what you're supposed to walk away from when you read the book of Revelation is not an understanding of the future, is not an understanding of Israel, is not an understanding of the nations of the earth or even the church. It's a, supposed to be a revelation of who Jesus is. You're supposed to know Jesus better at the end of reading Revelation than you do at the beginning. Now, I know that's new information for some people, but that's what we're on about here. We've been studying since last January about who Jesus is. And in Jesus Doing Life Part 1, which we did through Easter, we learned that Jesus, the first time he came to earth, came as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But as Jesus comes again, and the Bible teaches us all through the New Testament, and indeed all through the Old Testament, that the Messiah doesn't come just once, he comes twice. The first time he came as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The second time he's coming to finish the mission, which is to be the judge of all the earth who will do right. Somebody say amen. amen. Now there are some characteristics that we're studying about Jesus that do not change no matter whether he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world or the judge of all the earth who will do right. Number one is that God loves. And love, no matter what his role is, whether he's here as Lamb of God taking away sin or judge, he loves. Somebody say amen. amen. Love is still his way and it's his command to us. Now, interestingly, we never, the church, never becomes the judge of all the earth. That's Jesus' job, not our job. It's not our job to judge the world. It's not our job to fix the world. It's not our job to change the world. It's Jesus' job to do all those things. Our job is to love people and to share who Jesus is with them. That's the end. That's it. You change no one. You fix no one. You don't even fix yourself. Isn't that glorious? Jesus does all that work. How does he do that work? Through your faith. It is by faith you are saved. It is by grace you are saved through faith. Amen. Not of yourself. You don't save yourself. You don't fix yourself. You don't help yourself. Jesus helps you. And how he does that is when you put your faith in him. I cannot tell you the number of times in the last months that I have had to remind people in the church, you can't fix that. Amen. But Pastor Jay, I've got to change this. You can't change that. I've got, to, I've got to save my brother. I've got to save my sister. Last time I checked, you weren't Jesus. 
Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the judge. Oh, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to knock them down a couple pegs, Pastor Jay. They're getting a little too high and mighty. Don't worry. The Bible says pride goes before a fall. Give people enough rope, they will hang themselves. You don't have to hang them. We got to fix this. Nope. What are you going to do, Pastor Jay? I'm just going to stand here and watch. <laughs> it's a train wreck. It's a dumpster fire. I know. I don't have a fire extinguisher. What am I going to do? Jump in the dumpster and jump up and down on the burning cardboard? How effective is that? How about we pray for rain? Do we truly believe God loves? And if he loves, will he not save? And is there something for us to do? Well, when he tells us to move, we move. When he tells us to stand still, we stand still. When he tells us to speak, we speak. When he tells us to shut our yaps, we shut our yaps. Love is still his way and his command, and in all things, we are called to love had this great conversation, not really a conversation, it was online, uh, but we, it started in church and it went online. How do we know that we're doing God's will? Well, are we lining up with the fruit of the Spirit? Is it loving? Is it joyful? If it's love, joy, peace, is it peaceful? Is it gentle? Is it kind? Is it faithful? Is it meek? Is it in self-control? Anytime we're walking away from those things, we are no longer doing God's will. If we have lost our love, if we've lost our joy, if we've lost our peace, if we've lost our gentleness, if we've lost our kindness, if we've lost our faith, if we've lost our meekness, you know what meekness is? Not today's sermon, study it. If we've lost our self-control, if we're not in control of ourselves, we're not in God's will. Ooh. Powerful thoughts. Love is still his way and his command. So God has also revealed a couple of things to us through talking to his churches. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, which are letters to his churches, we learn these things. God is a God of relationship. He does everything through relationship. God does everything through relationship, not ritual. God is a God who in this world allows and walks in suffering. Jesus suffered. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. God weeps over the condition of the earth. God embraces suffering, and he expects his people to embrace suffering. God is a God of purity. He's single-minded. God doesn't have a whole lot of obje objectives. He has, his objective is to build his kingdom in your life and in the universe. God is a God who demands complete control of all of our lives. Control, that's a bad word, Pastor Jay. I don't like that word, control. That's because you've never let God do it. You've let lots of people control your life. But when God controls something, everything comes out better. God is a God who does not like hiding or hypocrisy. And he ferrets it out in our lives continually. I don't know how many times God has come to me and said, uh, that was rather hypocritical, right? God's, we, uh, Ray and I were talking. God's first question in the Bible, you know, anybody know what it is? Where are you? Is that because God didn't know where Adam was? No, it's because he wanted Adam to know where Adam was. Amen. He wanted Adam to stop hiding. And God is always about getting us out of our hiding and becoming authentic, transparent, and vulnerable. Ooh, I hate those words. Right? God is a God who has a specific mission that he's given to us. Our mission is to reach the lost while we're sending the found. While we're doing life together, we will discover our gifts and change the world. Can anybody say amen? amen. Is that the mission you're living out right now? Good. 
Good. If you're not living that out, get on God's page. Is that too harsh? <laughs> God is a God of passion. My sister and I were in a conversation while she was home, and I said, you know, we're really good. The church is really good at making the most exciting adventure in the universe sound really boring. Do you know we are on the most, we're on the wildest rise. Disney has nothing compared to the Christian life. And yet we make Christianity sound dull, boring, and dry. Can I tell you, being a Christian is none of those things. This is a great adventure we are living. And it's a, vision, it's a vision that Jesus released into our life, bringing true passion. We learned that in the last days, there is going to be trouble. God is going to allow trouble to come onto the earth. Does God make trouble? Does God cause trouble? No, but God is going to allow trouble to come onto the earth. Why? To drive those who are his into his arms. Wrap me in your arms. It's a sad statement of our fallen condition that so many times we need a problem to drive us into the arms of Jesus. Amen. We won't go there of our own volition. If things are going really well, if there's nothing to press us towards God, we won't go towards God. We'll just sit and say, I'm fine. I'm fine. That's the church of Laodicea, everybody. And Jesus said, to that church, I will spit you out of my mouth. <laughs> How are you? I'm fine. God hates that. Not if you're really fine. Just most of us aren't really fine. <laughs> right? God, if you can't be honest with anybody else, at least be honest with God. How are you? When God says, where are you? Be honest with him about who you are, where you are, and what you're doing. He knows it all anyway. God has a plan to rescue his faithful church from the judgment to come on the earth. It's called the rapture. We studied that in detail. If we are to stand in the evil day, this is what we talked about last week, we must know our identity as the bride of Christ. What is the bride of Christ? Well, we, we've talked about that. Uh, Brenton Dowdy last week talked. He did a great job. He gave me so much material to work with, we're going to be talking about the identity, our identity as the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. And we, I just did five lessons on Facebook about what the bride of Christ is according to the scripture. And as we looked at Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, and Ephesians chapter 5, uh, the end of the chapter, and as we went back to Isaiah chapter 62, and then back to Revelation 21 and 22, what we realized is that the bride of Christ, and I'm not going to go into it too much here because it'll take up all of our time, but the bride of Christ is not just the church. In some places, the bride of Christ is, mess, is referenced as Israel. Israel is called the bride of Christ. In some places, the nations are referred to as the bride of Christ. In some places, the church is called the bride of Christ. In some places, the, the city of God is called the bride of Christ. In some places, the, the new heaven and the new earth is referred to as the bride of Christ. So who is the bride of Christ? All of that is the bride of Christ. It is... The church and Israel and the nations of the earth all coming together. The earth itself suddenly walking into the fullness of God's plan. Do you know God's plan for you? Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, says God. They are plans to bless and to prosper, to give you a hope. As Christians, we are walking into the greatest hope that the world has ever known. Our lives are being conformed to the image of Christ. Do you know what that means? No. But it means that we are being transformed back into what we were always meant to be. The bride of Christ is the fulfillment of God's plan on earth. It is when we become like Adam and Eve before the fall. Some people, some of you have asked me, well, will we be, at the end of time, will we be tempted to sin? The answer to that is, we will be like Adam and Eve before the fall. Free. Right now, none of us in this room 
is free even though we're free. We've been corrupted by the, we've been touched by the power of sin. And even for those of us who have victory over sin, we still remember sin. And I'm going to tell you this, we remember it fondly, most of us. Even those of us who count it as dung have our moments where like, that was horrible, I want it back. There are moments, they become fewer and far between, but there are still moments of temptation. That's what temptation is. Temptation is a desire to sin. And if you're never tempted, well, you're one of two things. Dead or totally unevaluated. <laughs> right? Like, Because we've been touched by the power, and the power is still here. Amen. The power of sin. Sin is a power. It's like electricity. It's not, it's not good. It's not like a sin is a, good, a bad thing and righteousness is a good thing. Sin is a power that courses through everything. It causes bad behavior, number one, which is what we usually equate it with. But it causes sickness. It causes death. It causes... It causes war, it causes famine, it causes pestilence. All of that has to do, is all of it is connected with the power of sin. And even during the thousand years, the power of sin will still be on the earth. It's not until God creates the new heaven and the new earth that the power of sin is done away with. There will be no more sin. None of us knows what that's going to be like because none of us have ever experienced it. Right now, we are Christians sealed by the blood of the Lamb. It's like we've got these Jesus wetsuits on, but we're still swimming in the same river. But on that day, we get out of the river, and the river dries up, and it never comes back. Hmm. That's the bride of Christ. We'll talk more about that as we go along because it talks about, it tells us why God has to judge the earth as he does. As we come to know ourselves, we must also come to know the Lord in seven attributes. And this is where we are in Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. If you want to turn there with me in your Bibles, uh, it'll be up on the screen as well. John the Revelator, John the Apostle, writes these words. After this, we read these right at the beginning of service as well. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their head. From the throne came flashes of lightnings, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Everyone say seven spirits of God. Also in front, can I have somebody turn the fans on if they're not already on? I'm about to expire here. I will see the seven spirits of God before all y'all. Somebody doesn't turn on some cool air. These are the seven spirits of God. Everyone say seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass clear as crystal. So we're talking now about seven, the seven spirits of God, seven attributes that Jesus uses to reveal himself to us. In Revelation chapter 5, these, the seven spirits of God is used to refer to Jesus himself. And so we know that these seven things are, these seven spirits of God are seven revelations about who Jesus is. So it's important for us to know who, what these seven spirits are. We find them, in order to find out what they are, we have to dig all the way back to the book of Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, where the Bible says, and Isaiah says, through inspiration of the Spirit, says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. That is Jesus. Jesus is the shoot that comes up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch, large B, will bear fruit. That is Jesus. 
And so what do we see this fruit as? What do we see these seven spirits, these seven attributes as? The spirit of the Lord, which we talked about two weeks ago. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, which we'll talk about today. The spirit of counsel and of might. And at least we'll talk about them if we have time. The spirit of counsel and of might, which we'll talk about next week. And the spirit of the knowledge and then the fear of the Lord. So we have these, so we've talked about the spirit of lordship, and today our job is to talk about the spirit of wisdom. What's wisdom? Shout out some answers to me. Wisdom, what's wisdom? When you think of wisdom, what do you think of? Knowing how to use knowledge. Knowing how to use knowledge. Great academic definition, Jody. What else? Knowledge through experience. Great, Jerry. Somebody else. Wisdom. Understanding. Awesome. Great. Understanding. Somebody else? Only comes from God. Okay. So let's talk about this thing called wisdom. There's a whole book dedicated to it. It's called the book of Proverbs. And I think that when we think of wisdom so often, we think of, we, we think of like someone who's really smart and someone who's kind of crafty knows how to knows how to work around things and get around things and make things work and i guess that's one in in greek the word is sophia but like so many words wisdom we've kind of we've kind of dumbed the word down like we've dumbed down the word love love is a love is this incredible word that almost nobody really knows what it means anymore. Um, we, in our, in our culture, have almost changed the word love to mean sexual attraction. And uh, even those of us who have studied the word, that's, we, you know, Jody preached a sermon a couple weeks ago, and it was, it was written uh, off, his opening comments were from Tina Turner. What's love got to do with it, right? What's love but a second-hand emotion? And that's, what, that's where we go when we think very shallowly about love. And we do the same thing with words like wisdom and peace. What is peace? Well, it means you don't fight. But that's not what peace is at all. Peace isn't an absence of fighting. It's completeness. The word is shalom. Shalom doesn't mean no fighting, no striving, no conflict. It means completeness, being whole in all your personhood. That's peace, being complete and whole as a person. Wisdom is sort of the same thing. The word for wisdom in Hebrew is the word chachma. Everyone say chachma. That's good. It's a good, good way to get the phlegm up. I want to talk about two aspects of chachma today, wisdom. The first word is the word skill. It's skill. God has the spirit of chachma upon him. His Jesus is the spirit of chachma. He's the spirit of skill. Let's look at a couple times that this is used in the Old Testament. Exodus 28.3 as God is talking to Moses about the building of the tabernacle, and he says, and you shall speak unto all that are wise-hearted, hachma-hearted, skilled-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, hachma, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Wait a minute, what? Wise people... God needed special wise people to make clothes for the high priest? Did they have to like have a master's degree or a PhD in order to sew Aaron's clothes? Was that the requirement? Oh, you have to be good at sewing and you have to have a PhD in philosophy. Was that what, they, was that what God meant about wisdom there? No. He's saying, I have raised up people and skilled them in the ability to make these garments. I've gone ahead and I've given the skill to them. They know how to do it. 
These women that were sewing Aaron's clothes, they weren't PhDs. That's not how they were wise. They were skilled at doing something God needed done. Exodus 35, 35. Them has God filled with wisdom, skill of heart, to work all manner of work of the engraver and of the cunning workman and of the embroiderer in blue and in purple and in scarlet yarn and in fine linen and of the weaver, even of them that do any work and of those that devise cunning work. Hachma, God gave wisdom to the artisans who were building the tabernacle. They were skilled in what God had called them to. Wisdom is skill, it's ability to do something for God. It's also wisdom in administration or in living out the practical ways of the Lord. Deuteronomy 4, 5, and 6, Hachma is used a little bit differently. Look, I now teach you these decrees and regulations. So here God is talking about the law. He's talking about the Bible. He's talking about the precepts of the law. And here he says, I'm teaching you these decrees and regulations just as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy. Obey these words completely and you will display your wisdom, your chachma, and your intelligence among the surrounding nations. When they hear all these decrees, they will exclaim, how wise and prudent are the people of this great nation. So it's different. Here it's, it's wisdom and administration for living out the practical ways of the Lord. It's skill and it's ability to live out the practical ways. Now, what does this mean? Because the Bible is saying here that God has the spirit of wisdom. Jesus has the spirit of wisdom. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 127, 1 and 2. This is what we started just a few minutes ago. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture. It says this, Unless the Lord builds the house, the, workers of the, build, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. The Lord has skill in building his kingdom. And the Lord has wisdom in administrating his kingdom affairs. Our job is not to fix, I said this earlier, our job is not to fix the world for Jesus. Jesus knows what he's doing. He has the spirit of wisdom. And he has given us some information about what his wisdom is going to look like in our times. Our job is not to convince Jesus not to do what he's already prophesied he is going to do. Amen. Our job is not to stop Jesus from doing what he's already prophesied he's going to do. Our job is to get in line with Jesus and to walk with him as he in wisdom carries out his work. He is the spirit of wisdom. God knows better than we do why he has to do the things he's got to do. Some of those things he's revealed to us. And if you dig deep enough into the word, you can see why God has to do what he's going to do. We're going to do a bit of that digging in the weeks and months to come. But let me just assure you that as you read the book of Revelation and you say, wow, God is a nasty God, that is not God at all. He is a God of wisdom. He is a God of skill, and he knows what he has to do to get the job done that we want him to do. And there is no other way for him to do it. And when we try to get in God's way and stop God from doing what God has already said he's got to do, we are just going to get run over by the truck that is Jesus Christ. Amen. And I feel like so many in the church are trying to accomplish things that God is saying, I'm not building that. Church, unless the Lord builds the house, Unless the Lord protects the city. 
Unless the Lord builds the house, the work of the builders is wasted. And unless the Lord protects the city, guarding it with centuries will do no good. And the whole book of Revelation is about God removing his protective hand. What are the judgments? That God's saying, now it's time. I'm pulling back the spirit of protection that I have over Europe. I'm pulling back the spirit of protection that I have over the Middle East. I'm pulling back the spirit of protection that I have over South America. I'm pulling back the spirit of protection that I have over Australia. I'm pulling back the spirit of protection that I have over America. And you can choose to be a sentry if you want in a city from which God, which God is not protecting. But what does that avail you? There's one place. There's one place that the Lord has told us there will be safety in the days to come. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. Just don't let that settle for a moment. We get to choose, are we gonna join God in his wisdom? Or are we going to say, God, it's not fair what you're doing, and I want, I'm going to make it go different, and you need to follow me. Psalm 127, 1 and 2. Secondly, we have the spirit of understanding and discernment. This is the word bina. Lord. The Bible says, this, the seven... The, the, the seven Fires before the Lord are the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, and the spirit of understanding. What is understanding? Going back, going back to Deuteronomy 4, 5, and 6. Look, I now teach you these decrees and regulations, just as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy. Obey these commands completely, and you will display your wisdom, your hachma, and your intelligence. Bina, among the surrounding nations. When they hear all these decrees, they will exclaim, how wise and prudent are the people of this great nation. When we obey the commands of God, we are both wise and intelligent. We become both skillful to carry out God's plans in the earth, and we become intelligent, and God stops saying, wow, they're dumb. I don't know how many times I've sat before the Lord in repentance. And this is going to sound bad, but God has come to me and said, it's okay, it's okay, you're just not very smart. <laughs> you're kind of dumb. You know why? Because every time I have to repent, it's because I'm not obeying the scripture. And God says, if you want to show your intelligence, obey the scripture. And if you don't obey the scripture, then you are... Yeah. Isn't that, isn't that amazing how simple that is? Obeying the scripture, intelligent. Not obeying the scripture, dumb. Right? Sometimes it doesn't seem so dumb, and that's why we go do it. And then we disobey God, and we go in a re direction we don't want to go, and we end up repenting, and we say, God, that was dumb. Really, really, really dumb. I'm sorry. Why do we... I, listen, I still don't understand the whys and wherefores of all the scripture. There are a lot of scriptures that I'm like, I don't understand why it has to be this way. God, why? Why do I have to do it this way? And God says, because I'm God. All through Leviticus, I love that about the book of Leviticus. God never explains himself to the people of Israel. He says, don't eat lobster. And then when they say, well, why? I like lobster. God says, because I'm God. He doesn't say, oh, because they're bottom feeders and it's unhealthy for you and you'll catch a disease. He doesn't go into that. He just says, don't eat lobster because I am the Lord. End of story. If I'm God, Israel, you won't eat lobster. Now, Jesus undoes that later on, right? He tells us we don't have to, the dietary laws, whatever God has command, made clean, you know, yeah, right, Pam's over there wiping her forehead. I had lobster last night. <laughs> but Jesus came and he did 
three things with the law. He either undid the law, he kept the law, or he strengthened the law. Right? And, we, and it's up to us to read the scripture and find out, this is why God has kept saying to us over and over again, get in your word, because we need to be people of the word. Because that's how we become intelligent and not dumb. <laughs> right? First Chronicles 12, 32. This was a passage that Pastor Risto absolutely loved this passage of scripture. He would quote it all the time. From the tribe... People from the, men from the tribe of Is, Isachar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives, and all these men understood. They binod. They, they were intelligent about the signs of the times, and they knew the best course for Israel to take. God has the spirit of understanding. God has understanding of our times. He knows exactly where we are in history. We don't, but he does. He sees and understands our times and seasons from far off. And he sees them from the perspective of the whole world. Listen, God is playing, I said it last uh, two weeks ago, God is playing a game of, of three-dimensional chess here. And we're not going to understand all the rules and we're not going to understand all the moves that God has. We're not even going to understand some of the moves that God calls us to make. I have to tell you that as pastor right now, there are some things that God is telling me to do, and I'm saying to God, that does not make any sense at all. What? I'm going to God in prayer, and I'm saying, God, what the heck? And God's saying, are you going to trust me? Are you going to trust me? Are you the one who's the master of three-dimensional chess, or am I? And there are things that God is doing that I'm like, okay, why, why? And you know what he says to me? I am God. God is playing a much larger game than any one of us in this room is. I have no sway. I have zero control over what happens in Washington, D.C., I have less control of what happens in the European Union. Oh, Pastor Jay, you have a voice. You could protest. And what would that accomplish? I hold my little sign up and I say, I am Jay Lilly. <laughs> and the people in their padded halls in Boston say, who's Jay Lilly? <laughs> but you know where I do have influence? right here. And we have influence in our town. It's so easy to jump up and down about things that we have no control about while we're letting things that we do have control over go crazy. Right? Oh, the government is, this government spending is out of control. <laughs> yep. Dumpster fire. I have no control over how the government spends the money that we give them in taxes. But you know what, you, what I do have control over? My checkbook. And a lot of us spend a lot of time yelling about how the government is spending our money while we're not even watching how we're spending our money. We'll spend our money in all kinds of ungodly and unthoughtful ways, and we won't, and we won't even bat an eye at it. And then we'll make complaints about how the government's doing things. Glass houses, people. Glass houses. God has understanding of our times, and he knows, he knows our times and seasons from far off. He knows this perspective of the world, and he knows us close at hand. He knows the times and the seasons, how the times and the seasons will affect us on a personal level. He knows everything that's going to happen in your life individually, even as what's going on in America and Europe and all over the world is going on at the same time. He understands what you're going to walk through. And he understands how the plan has to work out in the nations. And he's shared a great deal of that outworking in the book. And he's invited us to look into it and to understand with him how things must play out in the nations and what that will mean for us personally. 
Here's what it means for us as a church. It means that no matter what else happens, we're going to continue to reach the lost here. We're going to continue to go as the found here. We're going to continue to do life together. We're going to continue to invite each other out to coffee. And we're going to continue to do chili cook-offs. And we're going to continue to build relationship with each other here. And we're going to continue to love each other here and love the world directly around us and the people directly around us. Are we there yet? Are we perfect at it yet? No, I don't expect we'll get there on this side of the veil. But we're going to keep working at it and working at it and working at it. Our communication level is going to grow and grow and grow. There are lots of things that I'm not communicating right now that the Lord is saying, you've got to start communicating that. you got to start talking about that. You've got to start sharing that. And there are lots of things in your lives that you have to become more open about and sharing. God is going to help us to discover our gifts. There are prophets and there are teachers and there are servants and there are people in this room who are gifted in all kinds of ways that they're not even utilizing yet. And God's about to release that anointing on people's lives. You may say, I don't know what my gift is, and that's okay because God knows what your gift is, and he's about to release it into your life. And through that, we'll change the world. I don't know how far our influence will grow, but I know this, we're going to make an impact here. Because God has told us, God has told us, God has told us that if we'll obey this command, we will see the world around us change. Now, There's a temptation. There's this temptation that we have. I know I face it. And if I'm facing it, I know you're facing it at times too. To take the control out of God's hands. Because we think he is neither wise nor understanding. I've had this conversation with at least two people this week. Why did God do that? That was wrong. I don't understand why God did that. That was bad. And it was simply a misunderstanding of who God is. God loves us. God has the best plan for us. And God has the best plan for our families. We started this service by talking about disappointment. And so many of us are disappointed about so many things. Like, if only God had done. But God knew. And God didn't. And there's a reason for that. I don't know what that reason is. He hasn't shared with me all your reasons, but he'll share with you your reason. If you'll go to him, he's just waiting for you to open the word and for you to look at it yourself and to go to him and be honest. Say, God, I'm disappointed. God, I'm hurt. God, I don't get it. Would you either show it to me in your word or send me somebody to tell me why? Show me, God. Church, there's going to be a great temptation in the days ahead. And this is one of the things that Brenton said last week. Whether we have massive revival and we need to plant seven churches or do 95 services, I don't know which the answer to that is. If it's 95 services, you'll be looking for a new pastor. Just because I haven't got 95 services a week in me. I don't know anybody who does, but if we have, you know, whatever, God. (laughs) I've tried to escape his plans more than once, and I've learned that that's fruitless. It's useless. I've run away from God so many times, and God has said, (laughs) where you think you're going. (laughs) I've quit this job so many times, and God has said, (laughs) where do you think you're going? One time I was convinced God was, God was sending me away, and then the whole staff quit. It was me and Pastor Donna. I was like, God was like, no, you're not going nowhere. All that to say that God's way is way better than our way. We have our plans. We have our thoughts. We even have our wishes and our dreams. And How many of you know that our plans, wishes, and dreams don't often work out the way that we thought they would? But if we put ourselves in God's hand, God knows exactly. God knows exactly. And if we'll just trust him. And Brenton said it last week. 
whatever happens, whether we have huge revival here or whether we have huge trouble here, if we know who we are in him, we'll be anchored. If we won't come to understand him and ourselves, then no matter what happens, the mess of it will take us down. The mess of what's coming will take us down. And we have to be a people who stand. I want to be a man who stands here. Regardless of whether it looks like what I thought it would look like or not. Now, how many of you are with me? I'm getting to the place where it's like, God, I could be wrong about a lot of things. And none of that matters. Just give me Jesus. I sang that song today, and I was like, I, God actually pulled me, up to, pulled me up, and I had to sit down for this one. He said, do you really mean that? Do you really mean it? And I had to stop singing it, because I had to think about that. Am I okay if all I think gets turned on its head, and all my plans get turned on their head, but I still get Jesus? And I'm going to say, yes, I am. If it doesn't work out the way I think it's going to work out, if it doesn't look like I think it looks, if God pulls something out of left field and it happens that way, as long as I've got Jesus. Here's a question for you. I'm going to have Patrick come up, and I don't know who else you've got on the team, but I'm going to have you come up, and we're going to sing that song once more. And today, if you're struggling with the wisdom of God, or the understanding of God, and you feel like, hmm, Pastor Jay's preached, and I'm not sure God's so smart. Listen, I, I say that, and everybody, everybody chuckles. But every one of us in this room, if you've been a Christian more than a hot minute, has been here at least once. Where you're like, God, if this is your plan, I can do better than that. Every one of us in this room has been there. And it might have been a long time since we've been there, but I'm willing to bet that there are some of us in this room who are at least in one area of our lives who are like, God, where are you? And I just want to say that Revelation chapter 4 tells us that his spirit of wisdom and his spirit of understanding are more than intact. God is skilled at taking care of your life. And God understands everything about your life more than you do. And the question that he's asking us today is will we trust him? Will you trust him? So if you're struggling with that, I'm going to encourage you to come and pray. And just sit at these altars for just a few moments as we sing this song. And as soon as the music starts, you can come. I'm going to invite my deacons and my staff that are here uh, to come and lay hands and just pray over people quietly. You don't need to <coughs> cast demons out of them or anything like that. Unless they've got a demon, in which case I'd appreciate it if you'd do my job for me. I say, <laughs> I, say, <laughs> I say that with tongue in cheek. But come to the altars and just give it to Jesus and just say, God, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with this area of trusting you. And I don't want to do that anymore. I want to trust you. And I need your help. Because again, you can't change yourself. He's got to change you. So as uh, Patrick sings out, give me Jesus, just come. Just come.
If you have to make a decision for Jesus this morning, if you've not yet made that decision, if you've not yet given your heart to him completely, then you belong at these altars too. This is a place for rededication, but it's also time a place for first-time commitments. And if you need to trust Jesus with your life for the first time, can I just encourage you to come up to these altars? You don't need me to say any words with you. You, don't, you can just ask Jesus yourself and say, Jesus, come into my life, just like, just like was just prophesied over us as a congregation. Ask him to forgive you and ask him to fill your heart. Patrick, take us out. Come now. Come now. Before I begin, I'm going to return to what was spoken even at the start of the day. Um, and I'm going to further that even a little more. This is a space designed for, this is a space the Lord has created for reconciliation for the thousandth time, the first time. This is also the space for conversation. I return to what was spoken this morning at the start. He's not scary. He's not far off. So I want to encourage you. Any fears, any doubts, any questions that you have, he's open to, he's willing. And it's, you don't have to be afraid to approach him with these things. You do not have to be afraid of it. This is healthy and this is safe to approach the Lord and ask him. I don't want anything but you. You're more than every dream come true. All of the things I thought I wanted don't come close to knowing you. Now that I'm yours and you are mine, our love is the sea. And forever in the pleasure I find looking in your eyes. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You I don't want anyone else and I don't need anyone 
you can Jesus you can sing it one more time all this world just give me Jesus give me Jesus you can have all this world you can Jesus, I pray that you would bring us as a congregation to the place where we say, I don't want anything else. I don't need anything else. Just give me you, Lord. Just give me you. Father, you see our hearts. You see our hearts as a congregation and you see our hearts as individuals. And you know, Lord God, that in both of those areas, we want to move forward. We want to grow in trust. We want to grow in faith. And we can only do that, Lord Jesus, as we come to know your word. As your word not only becomes words to us, words that we know, but things that we have experienced. So Jesus, I pray for everyone on these altars, and I pray for everyone in this congregation, that we would be given a supernatural glimpse into your wisdom. I ask for this congregation, Lord, to be given eyes to see. You said, Lord God, in Revelation chapter 3, that we should ask for saw for our eyes so that we could see. And I'm asking that for us as a congregation. Give us saw for our eyes so that we can see, so that we can truly see your plan at work in the earth and in our church and in our personal lives, right down to the very, uh, the very minutest detail. Let us see that you have a plan and your plan is a good plan. Give us saw for our eyes. Give the church saw for its eyes that we may truly see. We cry out for it, God. Help us to see your plan. Help us to understand your purpose and help us to embrace it. God, I know that you love us. And Lord, you're calling us to the greatest adventure that there ever was. We are called to, to run a gauntlet as a church. And we are called to, to win the race and we are called to persevere and we are called to fight the spiritual battles in heavenly places lord give us eyes to see help us to see that so much of what is going on in the earthlies is just a distraction and that what we are really called to is right here you've placed us here for a plan and a purpose and a blessing and a prosperity and a hope and let us not miss that blessing because our eyes are distracted looking elsewhere. Give us saw for our eyes so that we could see. And let us step into the call. And let us trust in the midst of the call. And even as we bring our questions to you, let us feel your pleasure as you look at your children and see them working in the fields, the harvest fields that you've placed them in. Lord, you love this people. You love this people. You love these men and women. And you've given me a love and you've given us a love for each other. And that love is growing. And we thank you for that, God. We see that. 
And we know that there is a purpose even in that. That the world around us would change. Let us be the catalyst for that change. Let us see where we fit into your plan. And let us embrace that. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. God is good. And I look forward to seeing what he is going to do with us. Are you looking forward to it too? Amen. God bless you and be at peace.